Welcome back to page 121. Well, most times if you follow my videos, you'll see that I try to keep a positive spin on everything that I review. Even if it's something I'm not real crazy about, I try to find the upside to it. No problem with today's subject. I love this book. This is one of my absolute favorite rule books of any game I've ever uh, played or read. The Dungeon Master's Guide by Gary Gygax. This book kind of set the standard for everything else and uh, gets it done. It's got its flaws, to be sure, but it's over 40 years old, and it's still being played. So, Gygax did something right with this one. So today I'm going to take a look at the DMG, the inspirational uh, inspiration for the name of my page, and we're going to take a look at uh, why there's a lot in here that you need to unpack, DM and player alike. The Dungeon Master Guide by Gary Gygax. This was released in 1979. I uh, saw many, many printings, even a different cover. I prefer the classic cover with the Efreet on the front and the City of Brass in the Sea of Lava on the back. This book, obviously one of my older acquisitions. I'm not sure who Jim Heckler was. He, uh, I got this at a used bookstore, but it was back when I was in the club and I had to stamp it. So here we are. We just have all kinds of stuff in here. This book set the standard for a lot of rule books to come. Now the standard, of course, has certainly been upgraded since then, and you could even say that there are a lot of books that never drew a direct line from uh, the Dungeon Master Guide to what they are now. And that's fair. It's just that this was kind of the first of the real rule books, at least that I encountered, and uh, it kind of set the standard for me. So we start with the forward by Gary Gygax, or Mike Carr, sorry, and then we go to the table of contents. I'm not going to go through every page of this book. I'm going to hit the high notes. Forward by Gary Gygax. And then how basically what role playing is, how to create the characters. Aging. We do use this in my campaign and always have. Uh, we've got the ages here. And then you get the benefits or detriments for character age. We do use this uh, and have at least since the very, very early 80s. This is one of the earliest things that we adopted as a matter of course for us. We do use unnatural aging, which is listed down here for casting spells, uh, speed, potion, uh, haste spell, uh, wish resurrection, that they do age you. This section is one of the more useful. We have uh, disease, Death due to age, that kind of stuff. And then what the character explanations are, what the stats are. Keeping in mind, this is Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. This is the third book of the first three rule books. The other two being Monster Manual and then Player's Handbook. Uh, Monster Manual 77, Player's Handbook in 78, this in 79. So the one line I always loved here was under Constitution, explaining what a high constitution does for you, and then ends with the great line, Rasputin had an 18 constitution. That just always stuck, stuck with me. So you get the uh, character class followers next. We use this in my campaign also. This is uh, something that we definitely stick to. I haven't really modified this much. And uh, I actually have, I'm going to say something that some people are going to be aghast about. But I have not only uh, always allowed my players to read the DMG, not that I could have stopped them anyway, but I've always uh, encouraged it. I feel if there's access, a wider access to rules, then there's a wider access to discussion. We can talk about what rules we like, what rules we don't like, how we want to do things. Beyond that, everyone currently at my table, which would be my wife, both my sons, my friend Craig and my friend Roy. My friend Mike is out on sick leave right now. Uh, but every one of us has DM'd at some point. Uh, the only ones who haven't DM'd at our table are my sons, who have both been a little uh, hesitant to do so. But they've DM'd their own friends and their own groups. So every one of us is a DM, so of course they need access to this book. But beyond that, even if they were just players, read this book. There's just so much goodness in here, and it'll add some depth to your character. I'm all for it. Oh, one interesting thing here for assassins. They, assassins have the ability to spy. That's something a lot of people don't realize. And again, if you only limit your players to the player's handbook, they don't know that. And unless you tell them, they won't find it. So, coming down to 
Monsters as player characters, something I've never really embraced. I tried a campaign years ago where I let everybody pick one monster. Uh, I had, I think, a werebear at the table, a gremlin. Uh, I forget the others. Uh, I went about four games with that and bailed on it. Not a big fan of monsters at the table. Alignment. I'm going to say something else controversial here. I think alignment saved D&D. I started with the white box set and then very quickly went to the Holmes blue box set where alignment really was kind of, if even really talked about, just kind of mentioned. Uh, alignment, because of that, there wasn't really anything to guide how we should behave. A lot of games ended with characters killing each other over the treasure. Now, maybe that was just our group, but I don't think so. So when alignments came in, we did play with them, and we strictly enforced them in the early days, and that really helped save the game. I don't think I would have stayed with D&D without alignments. It was just kind of, I don't know, it just wasn't fun for me when everything would devolve and everybody fighting over treasure. With the alignments, you had player characters who had guidelines of how they should behave and steps you could take as a DM if they didn't behave that way. Now, we still play alignments in my campaign. I always will run alignments in my D&D campaign. Because I have experienced players, it's not as big an issue. If they say, you know, I'm being lawful good, I can count on my players to play the lawful good. I rarely have to coach them on anything. Okay, coming down to alignment language. Threw those out. That was silly. That made no real sense to me. So we don't have alignment languages in our campaign. Uh, character expenses. Yes, we do charge money for day-to-day -day living. Uh, this goes into some details of uh, gems, which we do use, and then uh, armor, armor class, weapons, the bulk, the cost. Hirelings. Yes, I use this section quite a bit. I, I, I like hirelings in my game. We use them quite a bit. Uh, some hirelings have become famous in my game. My first successful character, Lord Sneezy, a fighter with a five dexterity. Thank goodness I got gauntlets of uh, dexterity quickly. Uh, he hired a fighter, a female fighter named Moose, who he eventually married, and a thief fighter named, or thief uh, NPC named Cicada. So Sneezy, Moose, and Cicada adventured many times together and uh, have gone on to retire in comfort and uh, be lauded as, as gentle beings who brought a lot of good to the Flanus. Sages. Before Dragon Magazine, this is all we had on Sages. I used to use the heck out of this. I actually prefer the Dragon Magazine now, although I do refer to this. In fact, I just referred to this a couple of weeks ago when a question came up about finding some information in our game. I referred to the Sage section. Hiring a ship and a crew. This was kind of interesting back in the day. Uh, there isn't a lot about hiring ships and crew, at least in early D&D. So we were kind of on our own with that. It was kind of nice to have at least something here. And then, of course, two of my favorite cartoons, the famous This Had Better Work. My friend liked that so much, he made up silkscreen shirts for a bunch of us with that on it. And then Dave the Barbarian in the Corner. Get the Barbarian in the Corner, another drink, quick. Just some fun little cartoons in here. Love the artwork in the old D&D books, always did. This is tracking time in the campaign. Something I have to admit I'm a little hand-wavy about. Uh, I do think time is important, but I'm not a slave to it. Uh, Bart Simpson's been 10 years old for over 30 years, so why not? Day-to-day uh, -day acquisition of cleric spells, very important part of this book. And uh, magic user spells and illusionist spells. We have since expanded these tables, but we do use them. And spell explanations. This is where a lot of this book comes to life. Well, actually, let me go back a little bit. We get the spell casting by witch doctors and shaman. Very useful because we had no real guidelines for that. Now back to spell explanations. This gives a lot more depth to the player character's uh, spell books, spells out of the player's handbook. This is why I recommend players uh, read this book. There's just so much more depth to be added reading out how the spells should work. The summoning triangles, that kind of stuff. Uh, what a call lightning is. Polymorph others. There's just a bunch of stuff in here. Hallucinatory forest. And this is just a must read as far as I'm concerned if you're playing a spellcaster. So cutting through here. Neat picture. Loved, always loved that picture. Uh, <clears throat> Adventures in the air. 
I was never a huge fan of the maneuver class of flying uh, creatures in D&D. Right here it's called out A, B, C, D, E. I get they needed something. Uh, I never really used it. I just, that I was kind of, no pun intended, winged. Uh, airborne and waterborne adventures. I'm not going to spend a ton of time in this section. Adventures in the Known Plains. This was good for when it was out, but we've had a lot better since then. Infravision, Ultravision. Very important definitions of those. And again, something I feel that players need to uh, have access to. Invisibility. Uh, is this the initiative system? Combat. The initiative system here. Uh, never liked it. I very quickly changed it. Uh, sometime in early to mid-82, we went to a D10 system. I'll spell that out a little bit more. I'm sure many, many people have adopted a similar, if not the exact same system. But I hated the D&D system. Rolling for sides with six-siders and tying a lot. It just wasn't a good system for my money. Uh, parlaying, uh, subduing damage on dragons. That's coming up. I've never use subduing dragon, damage on dragons, uh, undead turning, there's very important uh, information in there, and morale's never really been a big thing for me, I'm not a morale guy ever for player characters, I let them make their own decisions, I'll do it for NPCs, and depending on the situation, they'll run away, they'll stand and fight, but I don't roll morale. Alrighty, combat melee, who can get in front of whom, this is very helpful, Especially in the early days, we were all trying to figure out how this game was played. Uh, Monk Stunning, we've taken that out of our game. And let's get past this, and we'll go to the combat tables. Yay! For those days that you've gotten to the game, you're sitting down at the table, and you realize you left your DM screen at home. Oh, crud. Okay, well, I'll pull out the book. And you go ahead and you use these tables in the book. They're very good, they're very useful, way easier to have them on a DM screen. Psionics. Said, yep, psionic. Threw those out over 40 years ago and never looked back. I know a lot of people don't agree with me on that, and that's certainly your prerogative. If you feel it works for your game, great. I always felt it was something that never really belonged in D&D. Any psionic creatures like Mind Flayers, we've simply made their mental attack magic-based. Makes a ring of uh, uh, mental... I uh, can't think of the name right now, but the ring of mind shielding. There it is. The ring of mind shielding, much more important if it's magic-based and you add pluses to it to the save and reduce damage, all kinds of stuff. Going through here, experience level for value for monsters. This has been refined in second edition. They refined it even better. Uh, I use the second edition for the most part, although I used to refer to this a ton. The climate ecology. Yay. This was helpful before there was the dragon magazine articles before there was the wilderness survival guide. This is what we had. Use the heck out of this. Still use this. I still refer to this. It's nice to go back to a baseline on a lot of the stuff in your campaign. I still read this book from cover to cover periodically. I've done that four times, I want to say. And it's amazing the stuff that you quote know, unquote, that it turns out you don't know. Uh, sample dungeons. This is a sample of how to play. This goes on for a number of pages. Very useful. Very needed when this game was new. Uh, would be silly to find it in a uh, book now. Non-player player character traits, never really used that. This book fleshes out pretty much everything you would need to run a game. And I really appreciate the effort that went into to crafting that. Okay, we come down to construction and siege constructions. This was very important to us. Uh, I still use this whenever I'm doing a battle system game. I will go back and I will read this section over. Even though there are more expanded rules that are more modern, uh, this still has some pretty good stuff in it. Alrighty, coming down to Intervention by Deities. I've always handled that kind of my own way. Uh, Gamma World Conversion. Yes, here it is. The famous uh, Boot Hill and Gamma World Conversions for D&D. Six Guns and Sorcery is the section for Boot Hill. And then Gamma World Characters Converted to AD&D under Mutants and Magic. I did a little bit with the Gamma World. I was never a Boot Hill guy. Uh, I had a, a, one of my players who loved it and uh, kept telling us he was going to bring it to the table, and he never did. Um, old Western game, not really my, my flavor. Uh, Gamma World to D&D is tough. D&D characters are terribly fragile in Gamma World. If you've played Gamma World, you know what I'm talking about. 
And then magical research, again, for the first 10, 15 years, this was pretty much what we had. Use of magic items, energy draining. Uh, and here we come. What page number is that? Oh, that's page 121. Yes, this is what I named my YouTube channel for. Page 121 is the beginning of the magic item listings. They start right here. For my money, this is the meat of the book. And I wanted something that was exciting to me to name my page after. So I chose page 121 of the DMG. All the magic item tables. Oh, so many hours spent reading these, going over these pages, deciding what did what, and oh, so excited. And uh, funny, I mentioned in my video on uh, Wilderness Survival Guide how we use the Ring of Water walking to allow you to walk on uh, snow. And I had forgotten, because then I went and I reread the Ring of Water walking prepping for this video, and I forgot that that's right there in the description. So sorry, that was kind of uh, bad on me to make it sound like we innovated something when of course we didn't. It's right in the DMG. I'm mean, through all the miscellaneous magic items. Just so much in here. This is where a good DM spends a lot of his time, not just reading the magic items for how to give them away to player characters, but how to actually make them functioning in your game. Not just something the players get, but how they, they use it in any kind of innovations. Artifacts and relics. I'm going to be honest, in 40 plus years of D&D, yeah, I've given out artifacts and relics. Um, not a ton, but enough. And if you looked at the grand total over my 40 years, I have no idea what the number would be, but it would be considerable. I've played with a number of groups that were playing under a number of parameters. Some were going to be short-lived, high-level campaigns. Others are going to be starting at level one and working our way up. And some of those characters now are 35, 40 years old. So... It depends on the campaign, and, and that also varies how much magic I give out, that kind of thing. Some uh, games, I can be a flat-out Monty Hall. It really depends on the, the campaign. Uh, here we go. The swords. I always thought it was weird the swords and armor were in the back here behind the artifacts. I do wish they'd put these up front with the magic items. Swords, sentient swords are a little strange to, to use, but they actually go into a lot of good role-playing. Random dungeon generating. I used to use this for inspiration. I still will sit down with these tables sometime and throw some dice and just see what comes up and uh, what kind of fun we can get out of it. I always love this illustration because if you follow it from the beginning, right here, it follows, it becomes an entire dungeon adventure, which I thought was pretty cool. You go all the way through the dungeon, the various monsters, and then you come to the big boss. I thought that was pretty neat. And then random monster encounters. Uh, still use these. If I'm, especially if I'm stuck for an idea. Here we go. Random monster encounters. By monster level, use these for monster summoning as well. Although you have to kind of expand those these days. There are a lot more monsters than there were. Uh, I will still use these. If I'm stuck for an idea, I'm just going to sit and, and throw some dice and see who comes up. Random monster encounters. Still use these. Uh, still staying in the random monster encounters. And then, oh, this is a big section. Uh, Emmerichal the Chaotic. Who hasn't sat and thought about this picture? And I've added it to my game. He's been in my campaign. He's a character of my Greyhawk. I, this is just a sweet picture. Uh, uh, David Trampier picture. And going creatures in the lower plains. Uh, here we go. Alphabetical listing of monsters. You don't have your monster manual there you go here are all the monsters all the stats that you would need you can run the entire game out of this book you have your monsters you have your magic items you have your armor class tables i have run out of this book when i forgot my monster manual or a game has started that i was didn't know i was dming i've sure that's happened to other people you walk into a game and find out that everyone's there but the dm and suddenly a call goes up who wants to dm a lot of times I'll answer that call, and then I end up winging a game. I end up having to use these tables on more than one occasion. Gambling. I've always taken gamble care of gambling myself. Love poker. Taught my kids how to play poker when they were small. I feel it helps some critical thinking and uh, taking a look at numbers. So didn't really do much with that one. And traps. I will throw this. I'll bring this out occasionally. 
unexplained sounds and weird noises. Hmm, not not really anything I go into. And then different things you can cover in for dungeon dressing. And then we come down to herbs and spices. I'm not a cook, ask my wife. Uh, but it was kind of neat to have her herbs and spices since they do play an important role in D&D. &D. Uh, they can, depending on your game. My wife has done games where cooking and foods have been very important. She's a great cook. Here we go. Summon monsters. Here's your monster summoning tables. You can use the other ones as well. Uh, these are more expanded. And then how to create a party. And then your glossary. Big glossary, because this was all new to us at the time. And then the index. And nice little plug for Gen Con. Cute little cartoon there. And then what, what else you could buy for D&D at the time. And then non-player character trait tables summarized here. And that's it. This book is magnificent. It's 240 pages. And I love it. And I was wrong again. I always say oh, I'm not going to go through every page. And then once I get going, I go through every page. In summary, I love the DMG. It's still one of my favorite rule books that I've ever read of any game. Uh, it's certainly a very important game that I use every time I DM. Whenever I DM, the DMG Player's Handbook and Arnold Arcana are sitting right at the table. Uh, I'm going to do a video on Arnold Arcana in uh, another couple of videos. And I expect that one to be kind of controversial since that uh, changed the game in a lot of ways. But back to the DMG. I love this book. I recommend you let your players read it and enjoy it. And then have conversations based on what they've read. There's some stuff in there that, that you've read that you quote know, unquote, that they may throw a new wrinkle into. I've found it for years. I've found it very beneficial to have player characters read this stuff. And uh, honestly, it gives them a better basis to discuss elements of the game and maybe challenge you on some rulings. I have no problem with that. If you have good role players at the table, they won't abuse their actual knowledge of the stuff. They'll play their characters. I've never had a problem with it. And I don't anticipate having a problem with it. So that's my experience. If yours is different, please let me know. Uh, let me know what you think of the DMG. Uh, let me know what you think of the, all the core rule books. If you have any idea for future videos, any part of the DMG you want me to dial in on, anything like that, I'd be happy to, to take them under advisement. And in the meantime, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. And if you like what you saw, please like and subscribe and tell your friends. That's it for today from page 121. Thanks for watching.